Okay, let's start. A warm welcome to everyone to our webinar Introduction to Protection from Sexual Exploitation and Abuse. My name is Katharina Stahlecker. Um, I work at FENRO as a policy advisor for um, strengthening civil society. I'm very, very happy that we had so many people registered and joining today. Um, we not only have um, people from German NGOs from our membership, we also have colleagues from other European countries, from the UK, um, from Bond. Um, we have um, many colleagues from other countries international, Ethiopia, Nigeria, India, just to name a few. I hope you're all comfortable uh, and well in these tough times. So for today's agenda, what is our aim today? Uh, we would like to give participants a brief introduction to what PSEA is about, to international standards and good practices, and also some basics on how to deal with cases. I also like to, to mention what you should not expect. Uh, so we won't have a detailed discussion of practical examples and we won't have more in-depth discussion of standards and measures for PSEA. Um, so if you are already an expert or have a lot of experience in safeguarding and protection from sexual exploitation, this might not be the right webinar for you, but of course you're very welcome to, to stay. Um, the agenda for today, we will have a short survey on your background. Um, I will start that now, it will be anonymously. Then I will hand over to Christine and she will give us an introduction to uh, terms and definitions around what sexual exploitation and abuse is, um, an introduction to minimum operating standards. Um, we will discuss some example cases and some good practices for implementing standards. So. Now I will start um, a survey. You should see it on your screen in a bit. So the first question is, um, what is your area of work within your organization? So um, who is here today? Are you uh, responsible for safeguarding and protection from sexual exploitation mainly? Do you work in projects um, as a manager or um, a project staff? Are you in human resources or maybe general management or maybe something else? So you can all click an answer. As I said, it's absolutely anonymous. Um, and I will share the results in a bit. Okay, it's a mixed picture, but most people are um, in um, project uh, work almost half of the participants. We have some people from human resources, some from general management, and we also have some people specifically dealing with safeguarding and around 10, 15% others. Does your organization have a PSEA policy? Yes, or you're currently working on one or no? Okay, very good. Almost 50% already have a policy in their organization. Um, Roughly 30% are working on one and um, some don't have one yet. So maybe this webinar can be a good start um, for you to develop a policy. Who or what body is responsible for implementing um, standards around uh, protection from sexual exploitation and abuse in your organization? So is it the management or the board? Is it um, a focal person or a safeguarding manager? Is it the, the HR department or is it something else? Okay, interesting. So 44% um, say it's management board or also some wrote that in the chat. Um, some people say safeguarding focal person, roughly 30%, 10% mentioned the human resources department is responsible and then there's 9% other. Um, Somebody wrote that it's a mix of focal points, HR and um, senior management. So, um, Christine, if I turn to you, what do you say? Is this, uh, is this a typical picture or do you have any remarks on that? This, this is a typical picture across a number of organizations. Different people are responsible and sometimes it's really confusing because you don't know where to go and what to do. So, no, this is interesting to see. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you. Okay, so 
Thank you very much for your input. I will ask the final question and then we can head over to Christine's presentation. So the question is, um, have you had to manage uh, an allegation of sexual exploitation and abuse for your organization? Just simple yes or no answer to get a little bit information on your experience. There's an interesting comment in the questions uh, section. I have noticed that none of these polls indicate the presence of a compliance department or even a legal department in our organization's compliance handles many of these such things. Okay, that's a very good remark. So um, probably many of you feel the same. Thank you for that remark. Um, Christine, uh, is that something that you know of as well? Compliance departments look like different things across different organizations, depending on what type of organization you have and what kind of policies you have in place. Compliance can mean a variety of different things. Uh, again, depending on whether you're a child focused organization or one that works primarily with uh, political and advocacy issues, you may or may not have a compliance department or you may have an organization with only two or three people. So it really depends on the setup of the organization and how that plays out account across accountability and liability issues. Thank you very much. We see um, roughly 30% already had to manage allegations or were involved in that and 70% didn't. So as this is an introduction, I think this is a good starting point for you. And now I would like to hand over um, to Christine. Thank you very much, Katrina. I appreciate uh, the introduction that you've given today and welcome to everybody who's who's out there. I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to introduce myself. My name is Christine Ashbuchner. I am an independent consultant and my primary focus is on safeguarding on the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. And I do investigations for international non-government organizations and civil society organizations. I've been working in this field for more than 20 years now. I am a Canadian living here in Berlin with my family and I work both online virtually and I travel when necessary to do investigations for different organizations. One of the things that I also do our trainings and workshops. And I talk to people about what sexual exploitation and abuse is. And that's what we're doing here today. This is a basic introduction to PSEA. So what is the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse? Why do we talk about it? Well, it's, it's important. It's a part of what we do. Sexual exploitation and abuse is endemic in all societies and across all walks of life. It's not just something that we hear about in different regions where there's child sex tourism, and it's not just something that we hear about in conflict areas where there's um, beneficiaries who are being exploited by war. It happens in our everyday life. It happens here in Germany. It happens in North America, South America, Africa, Asia, around the world. Why else do we talk about it? It's a challenge due to the dynamic environments that we work in and the vulnerability of the people that we aim to assist or that we aim to work with. We also talk about it because it is a breach of our duty of care to communities and vulnerable people if we don't talk about it. It's also a reason for us to show that we are ethical, that we are practical, and that this does produce reputational challenges for different types of organizations, not just aid organizations, but development organizations, organizations that work with different social communities around the world. So what are some things that define the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse? Normally, I like to see people that I'm talking to right now. And at this point, if we were in a face to face, I would get people to throw out answers to what you think defines sexual exploitation and abuse. But we're not going to do that today. So let's go in and see what we have. Abuse. What is abuse? 
It's any intentional act to harm a person within relationships of responsibility, trust, or power. So if we take a minute to think about what it is that we do in your own job, when we work in different countries around the world, I know that we have a number of people here in Germany, but we also have people coming from Ethiopia. We have people coming from Somalia. We've got people coming from a variety of different places. In our work as civil society organizations, development organizations, or non-government organizations, we have an inherent role where we're in powered with more trust, more responsibility. And when we work with vulnerable people, there is a balance of power and trust that we have to maintain. So any intentional act to harm that balance of power can result in abuse. Going a little bit further into sexual abuse. What is sexual abuse? It is actual or a threatened physical intrusion of a sexual nature, whether by force or under unequal or coercive conditions. So this can mean that in some instances, somebody may say, okay, yes, I will do that, which implies consent. But if they're being coerced into doing something in order to obtain something, this is sexual abuse. How is it different to sexual exploitation? Well, sexual exploitation is any actual or attempted abuse of a position of vulnerability, differential power, or trust for sexual purposes. It includes, but is not limited to profiteering monetarily, so exchange for money, sex for money, socially or politically from the sexual exploitation of another. We've got a, another definition as well. What is the difference between sexual harassment versus sexual exploitation and abuse? Well, Sexual exploitation and abuse, or SEA as we often refer to it, occurs against a beneficiary or a vulnerable member of the community. And more often, you may see this when we are working in different countries around the world, where an organization is working with community members and a member of the organization is exploiting a member of the community for sexual purposes. Sexual harassment usually occurs between staff members when there's a differential power. So that, for example, is when a manager may say to a person who is looking, who has, has gotten a job saying, if you would like to have a promotion, maybe you come on a date with me. I really like the way you look. There's also differences between gender-based violence and sexual exploitation and abuse, gender-based violence. GBV is violence that is perpetrated against someone because of his or her or their gender. So this can be male, female, it can be a trans person, it can be somebody who is asexual. It can be boys and girls. Sexual exploitation and abuse can also be seen as a type of GBV, as a type of gender-based violence, as victims of SEA are often abused because of their vulnerability, their vulnerable status as women, girls, boys, and men. But when we deal with sexual exploitation and abuse and its prevention, there's other important terms in addition to abuse, sexual exploitation, sexual violence, gender-based violence. Staff members or organizational people, we also play a big role in the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. And so as a staff member, a staff person is defined as any person who works for you 
or represents your organization regardless of whether or not she or he is compensated monetarily. That means anyone who is a staff person, a volunteer, an intern, board members, consultants or partners, they are all held accountable to the organizational code of conduct, to any PSEA policy, safeguarding and or child protection policy. And I have a question, what other terms do we want here? Are there other people that work for your organization? Are there volunteers or different types of partnerships with your organization? And what other policies do you have that hold people accountable for their actions, especially in regards to the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse? It's a lot. And when we talk about sexual exploitation and abuse, we often forget that it's not just the people who are abused and the alleged perpetrators that are important. It's about us. It's about our actions. It's about what we do and how we behave. Because when it comes to prevention, everything should start with us. So let's go back to sexual abuse. What, what's an example of sexual abuse? Let's say you are an organization working with um, different school boards at the community level, and you're helping design new curriculums. And you receive an allegation that a local female staff member had touched a young boy inappropriately and intentionally as part of a child's after school program. This can be seen as sexual abuse. Well, what's sexual exploitation? Perhaps the national director of your office has numerous sexual relationships with a number of different female staff who come from the local community or who are expatriates. But it's noticed within the office that the members of staff who have sexual relations with the national director tend to have better paying positions, they get more perks on the job, and they seem to be treated differently than the other women in the office who have refused his advances. This is an example of sexual exploitation involving power dynamics in the office. Sexual exploitation can also look like that in the field, especially in the humanitarian field, where you may have staff members going out and exchanging distribution packages for sex or going to pay for a prostitute, even if it's legal in that country. But if it's legal in that country, what kind of represent what kind of reputational risk does that pose to your organization? Let's go to some questions and answers. I'd like to hear back from from you. It's a little quiet on my end, and I'm talking with myself. <laughs> yes. no. yes, we have some uh, questions and feedback in the in the chat box. Thanks for that. Um, okay. So for well, um, you asked the question, um, um, what other terms do we want here? So who else should we take into account? And there was mentioned implementing partners. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, there. The other partners, and I think it's an important aspect. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a question, which I think is quite interesting. Could it also be unintentional? So uh, neglect by organizations. Um, I think the UN definition includes neglect. So could sexual exploitation and abuse also be unintentional? Sexual abuse um, 
can be unintentional. It's primarily intentional. Abuse encompasses a variety of things. It can be physical. It can be sexual. It can be emotional. It can be neglect as well. And when we look at child safeguarding terms in particular, or, or terms that describe vulnerable women and men, boys and girls, neglect and emotional abuse is very high, especially among vulnerable populations. This is also a form of abuse. An intentional abuse may not always be something um, that's drawn to the forefront, but it's something that needs to have awareness raised around it. What is appropriate behavior? What are appropriate ways to work with people, to live together in a community as an organization to show that we are doing the most that we can to show alternatives to discipline, for example, to show what or to help vulnerable communities meet their basic social needs so that um, neglect doesn't become an issue. Neglect becomes abuse when it is intentional on the side of a person, okay? Unintentional neglect, I've not actually seen, <laughs> to be honest. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I have uh, three more questions um, right now. The first one would be um, about the definition about harassment. There has been some confusion whether this includes only staff members or some organizations also uh, define it more broadly. And this is a bit confusing if different funders and organizations uh, use different terms. What can you say about that? Um, in the context that we're speaking about today, about sexual harassment, usually it's any unwanted comments or um, physical touchings or interactions. We're talking about with the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse within, within these parameters. So it's primarily within the office space. It's harassment. Um, you can harass community members as well. You can harass vulnerable people as well with unwanted comments. This wouldn't necessarily be exploitation. But when you're taking um, a position where you're trying to exchange something for that harassment, that's when it becomes exploitation. Different organizations will define it differently depending on what they're willing to deal with as well. For example, an organization may decide that they are able to deal with allegations of sexual harassment because they have the capacity to deal with them. And so harassment then will encompass perhaps sexual harassment, verbal harassment, physical harassment, bullying, and then they will deal with those different allegations in different ways. Other organizations may not have the capacity to deal with those and may say, okay, we're only dealing with spe a specific type of harassment. It's going to be in our code of conduct phrased as this specifically, and this is how we're going to deal with it. Again, it comes down to what an organization wants to show within their own accountability and what kind of policies organizations will have in place and what kind of support from senior management comes in in order to implement those policies. Thank you. Um, I have two more really interesting and I believe also a little bit controversial questions. questions. Um, so the first okay. one would be, what about the perpetrators? Um, there were some questions if it's mainly men or also women. There were also some remarks that, of course, sexual violence is gender neutral. So, of course, perpetrators are not only men and it might be dangerous to speak only about men. So what can you say about that? Perpetrators come in all shapes and forms. They are men, they are women, they are, they are I hesitate, to say boys and girls as well, but they do also offend. Um, when we look at uh, statistics or when we look at um, the rate of, of offenses, getting our numbers coming from prison systems or from people who have been convicted of such offenses, 
more than 90% of offenses tend to be male. But that's not why women don't abuse. We don't hear about it as often, partly because of the stigma attached to it and partly because it's taboo. So when we hear sexual violence and sexual abuse, we tend to hear about convictions of male perpetrators or alleged perpetrators. We are getting an increasing number of female perpetrators that are being charged and convicted. Right now, this is at only about 5%. Um, more and more people are opening up to speaking about female perpetrators of sexual violence, and this is starting to come through now. And Gender-based violence is neutral, I would say, because it does happen across. It's about helping people understand that they have a voice to express it and that it's safe for them to say who their alleged abuser is. And if possible, and when possible, um, to talk about that freely and openly through their healing process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and the last question is equally uh, broad and important, I think. So many people asked about the, t um, the topic of consent. So, for mm -hmm. example, what about um, consensual relationships between a manager and um, a staff member, maybe even from uh, different, different organizations or uh, where there is a power structure involved? And also, what about cases where there has been some consent in the beginning, for example, if there has been some favorism or stuff like that, and what mm. if the consent is later withdrawn? So how do we deal with consent in this area? Okay, with consent, many organizations don't strictly prohibit relationships between staff members. However, they do highly recommend, or many highly recommend, that they refrain from having sexual and intimate relationships between staff members, partly because of the issue of consent. One is the power differential. If you have somebody who's a supervisor or a manager having a sexual relationship with another staff member, it is not always clear whether or not it's a position that's taking advantage of that differential power and trust. It can be a reputational risk. It may be consensual between the parties, but what does it appear like outside of the organization? Because remember, with the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, and when referring to the Secretary General's bulletin that the UN has put out with the IASC in 2002, what appearances say a lot. And if it appears that there's a manager or a supervisor sleeping with a number of women from the office, it doesn't look good for the organization. It may go against the code of conduct because it breaches behavior standards. Now, consent can be given, but at any time, if somebody takes away their consent, then it's taken away and it's not okay anymore. Yeah? No, this is when no means no. Please stop. It may have been consensual in the beginning, but now I'm saying this is not okay for me anymore. And that needs to be respected as well. Thank so it's you. a gray area. And there is no right answer to it, but it comes down to reputational risk and looking at whether there's a power differential and if that trust is being exploited. Yes, that's very important. Um, that to have this in mind and to, to also see the gray areas and deal with them. Yeah. Um, I have one last question because it, uh, it has been asked uh, sometimes, again, about the harassment. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that there are different definitions. And as I, um, as I know, there are also different definitions, not only by the UN, but also by other organizations. Uh, what is included in protection from sexual exploitation and abuse? And I believe this is sometimes a problem because, for example, if harassment between work colleagues is not included, and as you said, some organizations don't include things because they don't want to deal with it, um, mm -hmm. what would you say, should we ideally employ a very broad definition and deal with, uh, with any incident, or how do we handle this? Is it 
because I mean, this is not only about compliance, it's also about responsibility towards people we work with and for. So what do you say my, about that? My inclination is to define what harassment is in different parts of the organization. I think having a broad definition of harassment leaves organizations open to choosing whether or not they deal with something or don't. And people can play with, well, I didn't really understand what it was. I think organizations have a responsibility to define harassment in different areas. What does it look like as sexual harassment? What does it look like as bullying? What does it look like as physical or verbal har harassment or emotional harassment? And how structures in place to deal with the different types of harassment. It may be the same structure. It may be the, we asked the question earlier, who is responsible in your organization for dealing with the implementation of, of SEA or other safeguarding measures? This varies across organizations as well, but often it falls down to disciplinary measures, okay? That are, by human resources or by senior management. Awareness has to be raised within the organization about behavior that is acceptable and behavior that is not acceptable. And without doing that, organizations can't expect people to adhere to any kind of policies without clearly defining that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I think... Um that's it from me right now. So maybe we move on with the presentation and we have another question and answer slot later. Okay, so here we go. Now, the Interagency Standing Committee put together a, a set of six core principles on addressing sexual exploitation and abuse. The Interagency Standing Committee is a group of organizations that work in the humanitarian context and with the UN and supporting different development organizations as well that have defined what should be done in order to address SEA. The first one is that sexual exploitation and sexual abuse constitute acts of serious misconduct and are therefore grounds for disciplinary measures, including summary dismissal. Sexual activity with children, so that's anybody under the age of 18, is prohibited regardless of the age of majority or age of consent locally. Mistaken belief in the age of a child is not a defense. What this means is that even if it's okay for a 16-year-old to consent to having sex, it's not okay if you are a staff person working for an organization to have sex with that child because it's prohibited under the codes of conducts under the Secretary General's bulletin and whatever core principles our organizations stand by, okay? Exchange of money, employment, goods or services for sex, including sexual favors or other forms of humiliating, degrading or exploitive behavior is prohibited, okay? Sexual relationships between staff and beneficiaries of assistance, since they are based on inherently unequal power dynamics, are strongly discouraged. This particular one goes back to what I was just saying um, about staff members, about a supervisor or a manager having sexual relationships with a staff person. Again, it can be based on inherently unequal power dynamics. And this is something that always needs to be looked at, I think. Where a staff member develops concerns or suspicions regarding sexual exploitation or sexual abuse by a fellow worker, he or she must report such concerns via established reporting mechanisms. This is where we as individuals working within an organization have the responsibility to be accountable 
for all of our actions, okay? And the last one, staff are obliged to create and maintain an environment that prevents sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. Managers at all levels have a particular responsibility to support and develop systems that maintain this environment. What do those mean? Well, sexual exploitation and abuse um, are grounds for misconduct. This is looking at your code of conduct. What are the disciplinary measures that can be taken and do people understand what those disciplinary measures are? How does an organization talk to their partners, their staff, their volunteers, their interns about what that means and what the expectations are for good behavior? Sexual activity with children, this is clear. Exchange of money, employment, goods or services for sex. The unequal power dynamics are something that also need to be addressed by organizations. Talking about what that actually looks like and means within an office is very important in order to be accountable to the people that we work with, okay? When managers at all levels have a particular responsibility, this is about the implementation of any of the codes of conduct. We asked earlier in the survey about who is responsible for implementing the code of conduct. The easy answer is that we all are. The more complicated answer is who's responsible for supervising that and ensuring that it's followed. And this is where awareness raising, training, advocacy within the organization and at the community level is extremely important. So how do organizations meet the core principles? How do they meet these standards? And this is where organizations I've, I've seen a lot in the past start to get really antsy. How can we do that? It's a lot of work to do. I don't know how to talk to people about that. This is where there are easy things that we can do and where many organizations are already doing things. We know from the people on this call right now that at least 47% of you already have SEA standards or some kind of code of conduct that addresses SEA. Having a policy on the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse is the first step. Having a focal point or a department that deals specifically with the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse is highly recommended. It's not always possible because of the capacity or the size of some organizations. But a code of conduct in employees' contracts and in partnership agreements is a way to meet it. Whenever you sign an, an agreement with a new partner organization, you can have a clause within your partnership agreement that says that they will abide by either your organization's code of conduct that addresses PSEA or they will have their own code of conduct that addresses PSEA. There can be staff inductions and refresher training on the code of conduct. How often do you do this or do you do it? There can be awareness raising about the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse with communities. There's reference checking as a part of recruitment. Now, in Europe and in North America, and in a number of countries that's, that we work in, in Africa and Asia, you can obtain police background checks. In some countries, you can't obtain them. And in other countries, you can obtain them, but you know that they're not necessarily true, that they're fraudulent or they're corrupt. So how do we do reference checking as a part of recruitment? There are a number of different options that can be done. Um, and depending on your circumstances, this may look very different. Um, complaints mechanisms and victim assistance. I also like to say survivor support because it's not, people are not only victims, they're also survivors. There should be a whistleblower policy for staff and investigation procedures. How do you deal with allegations that come into your organization? When you receive an allegation, you are accountable for dealing with it. I have um, a few questions um, 
about uh, uh, maybe a little bit different uh, topic at this point, but um, the question is, maybe it's also too deep to discuss it here in depth, it's about prostitution. So uh, how do we deal with uh, prostitution? Is it necessary to have a regulation for that? And there's always this, this controversy about um, can we really forbid staff from uh, going to prostitutes, especially if it's legal in a certain country? Okay. This comes. This is this is a hot topic. It's been widely discussed across a number of organizations, um, and it varies from organization to organization. Um, a number of organizations prohibit visiting prostitutes, even if it's legal, partly because it implies that it's still exploitation and it's a reputational risk for the organization one you're as an organization even if prostitution is legal you're not always assured that the women who are prostituting are doing so because they choose to do so there's a number of of women and men who prostitute themselves or are sex workers because this is their mode of survival. It's not necessarily something that they would choose to do, but it's what they do to survive. As an organization that's working to prevent sexual exploitation and abuse, when you have staff members, even off hours, visiting prostitutes in this area, it says to the larger community that you have a double standard. Okay, and so this is around organizational and reputational risk at this point as well. And if if you have a code of conduct that prohibit that prohibits visiting prostitutes, even if it's legal, then you would be in breach of the code of conduct. Okay, if you're a partner organization with any UN agency as well, you are bound by the Secretary General's bulletin, which which prohibits visiting prostitutes which is the exchange of sex for money regardless. And whether or not you're at work or you're on holiday, as long as you're under contract with that organization, you are bound by that principle and can be um, subject to disciplinary measures if you cross that. Now, again, this is up to the organization and how they enforce it. It's not a clear answer, and there is no clear answer, but when it comes to reputational risk and working with vulnerable people, what situation does an organization want to put themselves in, especially around perception? Thank you. Yeah. It is always not black and white. Um, so, uh, should we start with the cases? Yeah, we can start with the cases. We had a question about um, um, uh, emergencies, so cases in emergencies. There was um, a military officer that was um, sexually abusing uh, a middle-aged woman, um, promising her um, something in return, which she did not uh, get afterwards. And uh, when this was taken up by the leadership, it was not taken seriously. That is all the information okay. I get. Okay. I don't know if you can say anything about it, but especially the emergency as aspect is, is uh, critical here, I think, and the leadership aspect. Yeah. What I understand is that in the sexual harassment case, the harasser was eventually fired. But the anonymity of the person who made the complaint was made known. Um, in terms of this happening, ensuring anonymity is, is very important. As a human resources department or as a part of the organization that handles complaints, when somebody comes to make an allegation with you, you have to think about beforehand how you're receiving those. Do you have a safe way for people to make a complaint? Is there a complaints box? Is there a phone number that people can call? Or is there an email system that somebody can write an email to one person that is the focal point that receives that allegation? 
When you receive an allegation from somebody, an organization should ask that person outright, is it okay if we make your name known or would you like to remain anonymous? Now, in the cases of sexual harassment within the workplace, it's a little bit different in dealing with these issues as compared to dealing with cases of sexual exploitation and abuse. Because sexual exploitation and abuse, we tend to be dealing more with community members, right, where it is easier to protect their identity. But within the office environment, when it's one person's word against another person's word, especially with sexual harassment concerning two adults, there may be laws within the country that state that there has to be um, a dialogue between the two to settle to settle the issue, to raise the allegation. It may be mediated. It may be done through lawyers or maybe done with a mediation team within the office. Um, but it should only be known to the alleged perpetrator and to the complainant. Nobody else in the office needs to know that. So the people dealing with the alleg allegation need to think about ways of referring to the complainant, either through a changed um, identity number. So when talking about in in reports or in in messaging or with other people, you refer to it as a case number. You don't talk about it with other people with that person in the area. You keep only a small group of those who need to know in the know in order to deal with that case. You also have the people sign a confidentiality agreement saying that this is something that remains between the office that goes on file and between the complainant and the alleged perpetrator and the outcome of it is known between these people. It's not the business of the rest of the organization. OK, that's what is coming down to dealing with sexual harassment cases. If it becomes known who the complainant was, there's some damage control to do here because you may be putting people at risk. When dealing with allegations before they come in, I strongly recommend that an organization should do a basic risk assessment, okay? What happens if X, there is a sexual harassment case, involves Y, a person who is vulnerable within the office, perpetrated by Z, who may be a senior manager? Does the person who made the complaint, are they at risk of retaliation? Are they in physical harm's way from either the alleged perpetrator or from other people in the office? And what responsibility does the organization have to ensure the safety of the complainant, but also the safety of the alleged perpetrator? Because if, if it's known also the other way, what risks are there there for that? So before receiving any complaints, there's groundwork to do to address some of these issues beforehand. Um, in regards to the scenario where the complainant was, was made known, um, I don't know if any reparations could be made. I, I don't have enough details to talk about it, but I would imagine that on a case-by-case -case scenario, that senior management would need to sit down and, and determine what kind of damage was actually done. Because things that could be addressed are damage to livelihood income, damage to reputation of both the person that, that made the complaint, but also to the organization. And then how it actually rolls out in the future. In regards to the, the second case that you shared, Katrina, with, I understood it was a worker who had promised um, something to a community member in exchange for sex, and then it wasn't taken seriously by the organization. Um, was the staff member dismissed or, or um, uh, did nothing that. happen? It didn't say that. Okay. Um, it was just that, I mean, there was the mention that the leadership did not take it seriously, and I imagine because it was about the military. Um, okay. Okay. 
Um, when an organization decides to start dealing with the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse or have a code of conduct that includes that, it is paramount that senior leadership hold themselves as well as the rest of the organization accountable. If senior leadership does not think it important or take allegations seriously, then there cannot be the expectation that staff working for the organization, including volunteers, interns, partners, whoever else, will take it seriously as well. And this is a really dangerous area to be in, I think. When you receive an allegation, it's important that the person sharing that is believed. Regardless of what the person receiving the allegation thinks, it's important to say, yes, we hear you. This is about community accountability. This is about community responsibility. We as organizations go in, we are inherently given more power and more trust among vulnerable community members. And if we abuse that power, how do we expect that we're doing less harm? We will be doing more harm than good in those communities. So receiving an allegation is extremely important. Taking it up to the organization, it's important to be heard and to be dealt with within a very within a short time frame, so that people know that we take their concerns seriously and then to show people that we act on them. When we don't do that, we lose our reputation, we lose trust from the community, and ultimately we harm our relationship with what's going on. Thank you. Are there um, any other cases that people would like to share? Um, I did not uh, receive a detailed case. I received another question about um, what if there are um, two, uh, in this case, volunteers who know each other and they are um, 17 and in a sexual relationship in a country where this is the age of consent. Would this conduct the case or? So okay. Consent area as well. There have been many questions about consent. <laughs> Okay, this is where I think um, common sense also needs to take precedence. Yes, you have two volunteers. Are they in an equal, is one the supervisor of another? Probably not, right? Um, if they are, then I would be more concerned because remember somebody who has a higher position has more ability to promise something in exchange for something else, okay? But you have two 17-year-olds who are both volunteers. Are they working together all the time? Are they equals in what they're doing? It's the age of consent, but are they also community members? Are they getting to know each other? What I would recommend at this point, again, when volunteers come on, or when partners are co coming on, or when you hire new staff, you can say, look, this is what our code of conduct is. We discourage developing romantic relationships with each other because it, it, it can be to, and it can lead to something else, right? We're not here to monitor whether or not people fall in love together, okay? But as long as they're working for the organization, there's a way to maintain your behavior, what are your behavior protocols? And to say, look, while we're working together, while we're doing this, our behavior protocols and our good conduct, these are our expectations, okay? With two 17-year-olds, I would probably say, you know what, I, I hope it's okay, you guys are doing this, but as long as you're volunteering together, we would strongly encourage you not to date right now or to, to do whatever. This is what we would say, as long as there's no imbalance of power. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a look at the time. And uh, we are coming up, yeah. Yeah, so I think we should cut it here. There has been one other question related to cases, which and also the standards which might 
which might be interesting. Um, okay. Was the uh, the question asked uh, more times about the psychosocial support? Maybe you will get um, to this now. But is this something that is uh, explicitly included in the standards, or is there a recommendation? Because I assume that this is one of the most important things uh, when dealing with. Um, it's support to survivors and to alleged perpetrators and their families. Um, is recommended in the standards, what that looks like will vary, okay? And what an organization is able to do will also vary. Some organizations are very small, where there's only three or four people working in an office and there's not the capacity to provide psychosocial support. But what their responsibility would be in this case is to make sure that they have um, a referral system in place where they know the local actors in the community. Who are the organizations or people that are psychosocial therapists or psychiatrists? Or where is the local clinic that has doctors that can deal with different types of cases? What, are, what is the main contact? What is their phone number? What are their opening hours? And then you can at least share information with people about access to these things. Because then we have a responsibility to say, we can't support you in this way right now, but here are some contacts in case you need further support. We can help you contact them and go further that way. Other organizations are in a space where they are able to provide those different types of, of support. Um, depending on the incident or the allegation, an organization may decide that, um, for example, there's been um, a vulnerable woman who's been raped by a staff member. They may decide that for a certain period of time, they're going to follow up with the woman to ensure that the woman um, has access to health care and any medical visits. If the woman has fallen pregnant, maybe it's prenatal care and postnatal care until a certain end period. Um, it may be support through through a, a psychosocial program where there's different groups that work with survivors of sexual violence and things like this, okay? Again, that depends on the capacity of the organization. What is not okay is to say, we're not doing anything for you, go away. So there are different levels of support that organizations can provide, and this is something that they have to decide on at, from the senior management level and share that all the way down and ensure that there is appropriate things in place to support the organization to do so, okay? Thank you. Okay, so let's go on then so that we're not running over time. There are some minimum responsibilities, so it's the basics. What can organizations do to really start to meet the minimum standards for preventing sexual exploitation and abuse? have a full-time PSEA lead. This doesn't happen a lot, um, partly because of capacity issues. Sometimes it's because um, it's not supported by senior management. Sometimes they want it, but there's just not the funding to do it. So many times people will wear two or three different hats. This will be part of it, okay? It's a good thing to put PSEA into a job description to make sure that it is being addressed. So even if you don't have a full-time PSEA lead, you have somebody who has the responsibility to address SEA issues within the organization. Develop a strategy. How do you as an organization decide to address PSEA issues? What are the things you are going to do? What are the things you are not going to do? And how will you do the things that you decide to do? Train is, training and awareness raising. Talk about it. Break down some of the walls around sexual exploitation and abuse. Talk about what that means, about what it looks like in your daily working life and how we can combat it. Secure adequate funding to implement the strategy. You can have a great strategy, but if you don't ask donors for money for it, you're not going to be able to do it. 
mainstream it into all sectors? What does the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse look across all section, all sectors? What does it look like in communications? Well, for example, how do you portray children and vulnerable people? Do they look like they're falling down, dirty, always crying? Or do they look like people who are empowered to live the lives that they have with support? How does it look like in WASH? Where are your toilets situated? Are there lights? Is there electricity if it's available? Establish complaints and response mechanisms which hold organizations accountable as a safe organization for people in all community-based programs. Ensure that people know what a complaints and response mechanism is. Sometimes it's called a feedback and response mechanism. And are they contextual? Do they work for you? I can give a really good example. When I was, I lived and worked in Albania for, for some time, more than 15 years ago. And there was a complaint system being set up that was a series of boxes around the place. And people were expected to write down their complaint and put it into the box. Well, after some time, we got a complaint coming saying, why do you have boxes to complain? Don't you realize that during, during the time when we were under communism, everybody was expected to inform on everybody else, and they did this by writing down complaints and putting them in, in boxes. Nobody wants to complain like this. You're not going to hear from anybody. Take into account what works for the local context. Support your partners to become PSEA safe organizations. This is about having partnership agreements that include references to the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. Sharing awareness raising materials, helping to train or provide opportunities for training for your partners. And then implement the PSEA policy, including the development of a contextual national SEA policy when appropriate. So if you have a head office here in Germany and you have a policy or a safeguarding policy, a PSEA policy, a code of conduct, does that fit for your office that is working in Kenya? Does it fit for your office in Cambodia? Does it meet the same national laws? Does it meet the same religious context, how does it work for different areas? So what's best practice? Best practice is strong support from senior leadership to highlight the importance of SEA across all sectors, regional and international support, both virtual and face-to-face. SEA needs to be considered in assessments, evaluation, design and redesign phases of all programs and training and capacity building. Steps to move forward, integrate it into your strategy with budget and operational plans. Define the roles and responsibilities for handling and complaints and subsequent case management. We've seen that a number of organizations have already started to do that, and this is good practice. Integrate SEA into job descriptions, into performance agreements and performance reviews. Talk about it with the people you supervise. Talk about it with your managers. And if possible, develop a quick reference guide or pocket guides that you can share with people. What does, what's the definition of abuse, of harassment, of sexual abuse, of sexual harassment, and how does that work within your organization? And that, my friends, is the end of this, this presentation. But we still have at least nine minutes left for questions. And hopefully, we can cover all of those. And I'll hand it over to you, Katerina, to give me questions. Yes, thank you very much, Christine. Uh, yeah, there's a lot going on in the chat. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for writing your, your questions. So I have uh, three questions that have 
that are quite interesting, I think, and that have been asked multiple times. So the first one would be if we deal with partner organizations and um, we have as an organization a code of conduct and the partner might have their own code of conduct. Uh, how do we uh, how do we deal with that? Can we uh, should they only have one? Should they use their own? How do we do we come up with minimal standards? Is there a way? What what um, I normally recommend is whoever has the stronger code of conduct in in terms of dealing with sexual exploitation and abuse, that would be the agreement that I go by. So if your partner organization has a policy in place that um, that deals with harassment, sexual exploitation, they have a complaint system, they have the basics for handling investigations, then in the agreement you say, okay, following your code of conduct and, and going with that. If they don't have that, then say that they're bound by your organization's code of conduct and that if something comes up, they'll be held to the same standards as your own code. Okay, great. Thank you. Then there is another very uh, complex and interesting question. Um, it's about uh, how do we deal with the cultural context? And I mean, this is always a very important topic. And this one came from um, from a colleague uh, from a context in, uh, in Niger. Um, there's, for example, a problem to speak about uh, sexual exploitation and abuse between two men or a man and a boy, for example, because of the cultural context. How can yeah. these questions be addressed in a sensitive way? Um, I think often in, the, in these times, if you have a code of conduct, ensure that you're sitting with, with local staff who are already working in this field and get from them the words that can be used. Talk, get to know what the local context is and how people can talk about it in fields that are dealing with, with survivors or victims of sexual exploitation and abuse. And then if you're raising awareness in the community or among staff members, maybe you have to look at separating your staff. So you have males in one meeting as a focus group and you have females in another. And then, I mean, this is where you really have to engage with your staff and know what the local atmosphere is. Um, it can t sometimes I've been in some places where we we have pictures indicating not necessarily body parts, but situations that people will know what you're talking about, even though you cannot say it. OK, so it's finding ways around it, being creative with it. Sometimes it's it's done through through um, sharing stories. Yeah. And it's a. At this point, engage with, with the local community to find out what's appropriate, what is not, but to really address things. Sometimes there's different words for it. I mean, many people talk to their young children about different body parts. What, what words and how do they describe it with their children and then take that and take it one step further? Yes, thank you very much. Um, there is, I think we have time for two more questions. Um, one is very uh, short. It's about um, how short is enough time to deal with an allegation of sexual exploitation and abuse? So I yeah. think that's a tough one. Sure. <laughs> well, um, let's see. The ideal, in an ideal world where everything works, we recommend that an allegation is from beginning of dealing, receiving the allegation to closing an incident is 28 days, okay? So that's um, deciding whether or not an investigation needs to happen, if there is an investigation, dealing with that, and then um, doing a report and, and having any disciplinary measures if there is that. In reality, it's much dirtier. It can take a lot longer. Um, I have had some allegations um, that have taken months and years to close. Um, generally, we're, you're looking at three to four months if you have an investigation. What is important when you receive an allegation, you need to respond to the person who has complained or has whistleblown or whatever within a short period of time, within 24 to 72 hours. You need to respond to that person to say, Thank you for sharing this information with us. We take your 
your complaint seriously. We are going to do something about this. And what our steps will be, we will see what we're able to do, what the next steps are, and we will inform you what the next steps are. If you do that, when you receive an allegation, you usually build trust, and then you have a little bit more time to deal with it. But depending on what it is, it will it really depends on circumstances. Thank you very much. Um, so um, a few minutes to go. Final question, um, I think also a very interesting one, um, a bit about the, the scope of who is included and what kind of sexualized um, exploitation and violence is included. Um, for organizations. So uh, a lot of uh, exploitation and abuse takes place at home or with domestic workers and is um, not spoken about publicly. So um, it's difficult to get information on that. It's difficult to get hands on that. How can organizations handle that? What would you say? You mean in raising awareness and advocacy? About it? Yeah, that would be one way, I think. And maybe also if there are cases, uh, I if mean, they, is there a way to get, to get these uh, cases uh, to the attention of the organization? Uh, should How do we encourage people here in, in that direction, I think? When an organization decides to start dealing with PSEA and they start raising awareness in the community about what sexual exploitation and abuse is, and they provide means for making complaints, they are going to come. And I think uh, organizations need to let people know that they have a safe and confidential way of complaining and advertise what that is. Maybe it's through um, a local women's group that meets once a month who receive complaints in a way that, that were information this is how information is shared but they receive it anonymously maybe it's through an email portal maybe it's via phone and there's one person who receives a phone call okay this is what this is what um may change things but it's about building community trust and it's about dealing with the allegations that you receive because when it when the community and when people within your organization see that you are actually dealing with the allegations that come in, you're going to start receiving more and you will see an increase in that. OK, so it's confidentiality, it's safety in doing so, and it's about appropriate follow up afterwards. Thank you very much for your time today. I hope that this has been a learning experience for you and... I hope in the future that we can have a face-to-face. -face. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Christine.